Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our DSBC Fall 2021 discussion with Nina King. My name is Brian Edwards, and I'm the co-president and co-founder of the Duke Sports Business Conference, along with Miles Fjord. We're excited to begin our programming for this semester before our annual conference returns in the spring, following our mission to inspire students to explore the intersection of sports and business. We have the pleasure of kicking off year two with Nina King, Duke's recently appointed vice president and director of athletics. Nina will discuss her career in sports and the future of collegiate athletics. Our moderator for tonight is Dave Harding. He's a former Duke football captain who graduated in 2013 and now serves as the executive director of Blue Devil Network. Take it away, Dave. Good evening, everybody. And thank you so much, uh, Miles and Brian, uh, for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be with you. That, all that music got me ready for game day. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of excitement around Duke athletics. And a lot of that is because of the newly appointed athletic director. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest of honor this evening, the vice president and director of athletics and adjunct professor of business administration at Duke, Nina King. Nina, thanks for being with us. Hi, Dave, great to be with you. And thanks to Miles and Brian for the kind invitation to join everyone tonight. Yeah, what a great initiative this is and uh, the work of all the students with the DSBC and putting this together. Uh, Nina, I, I know um, you wear many hats. Uh, I've known you for some time. Um, you, uh, you know, outside of work are a mother um, and uh, are, are always busy running around doing something very important. I would love to kind of get a, a, a deeper dive maybe into your history outside of what your title is and uh, for people to get to know you a little bit more um, as, as a person. Sure, thanks for asking. Um, I am, yes, wife and mom. Um, I have two little boys, uh, Austin and Connor. They are nine and 10, third and fifth grade, and um, certainly very busy. And so uh, juggling their activities, personal, professional, everything um, keeps us on our toes, but I'm really so fortunate. And then um, my husband is a um, former college uh, student athlete. He was a soccer player, played, played professional soccer a little bit, and then coached um, in college soccer for a while, and then uh, worked. In, in development um, and now is a stay-at-home dad with our kids. Um, me personally, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. Um, I was a huge Bucks fan uh, back in the day when they wore orange and red, go Bucks. Um, and then I did my undergrad at Notre Dame. I was an accounting major. Um, I went to law school at Tulane, and I was fortunate uh, during my school years to have several internships. I interned in the Notre Dame Athletic Department, I interned at the NCAA, and then I spent two summers interning at Nike. So a variety of experiences in and around sport um, for my career. Then uh, after I finished law school, I went to Notre Dame and I worked in the compliance office uh, for three years where Kevin White, my predecessor here at Duke, was the athletic director at Notre Dame. And uh, then I was uh, fortunate enough to come with him uh, from Notre Dame to Duke. And so I'm starting my 14th year here, um, but month two as VP AD. <laughs> You know, when you look back on on your journey um, and obviously mentioning Notre Dame and accounting major, how do you and, and what really inspired you to become an athletic director um, throughout that path? Sure. Uh, well, it, it wasn't terribly clear cut for me. Um, so I never played sports growing up. I didn't play organized sport. And so uh, my family is kind of like, what do you do for a living now? This is crazy. Um, I was a dancer. I did um, ballet, variety of, of uh, dance activities growing up, but no sports. So when I got to Notre Dame, um, everybody did sports somehow, whether they were a student athlete or club sports, intramurals, rec, um, and I just didn't. Uh, so so I became a student manager. And for me, that was a way to get involved in sport. And Notre Dame has a great program. Um, they kind of commit to second semester of freshman year and do your entire uh, undergrad career there. And so I eventually became the head manager for the women's swimming and diving program my senior year. Um, and that's when I started to really kind of interact with athletics administration. And I thought, oh, these people have interesting jobs. And so 
interned in the athletic department, decided, yes, this is the career path for me. Um, but then honestly, Dave, um, I was very comfortable being a deputy AD, um, a number two behind the scenes, making a good athletic director go and really enjoyed, um, enjoyed my job. Um, and it wasn't until recently that I thought, you know what, why don't I want to ascend to the chair? Why don't I want to be the leader of an athletic department. Um, and so really just after a lot of personal uh, reflection, I thought, you know what, let's do this. Let's go for it. I knew I was prepared. I had been watching Kevin for 13 years here at Duke and, and at Notre Dame prior to that, obviously. Um, I knew I was prepared for it um, and decided to take the leap. And here we are. Here we are. And you mentioned getting that, in that chair. Um, it's, it's obviously been a, a short period of time since you've had that title uh, and you were kind of hit with a lot of things right away. What was the first time uh, where you were like, wow, you know, I am an athletic director and it's kind of like this aha moment uh, to say that you've essentially arrived there and now it's time to take action. That is definitely an easy one. So May 19th, press conference to announce my appointment as VP AD. One week later, we had a press conference to announce Coach K's retirement, and two days after that to announce Co Coach Shire's appointment. And that moment, I, that was my kind of, oh, wow, I am an athletic director. Here we go. Um, had to uh, had the, the privilege and honor of um, trying to figure out how to replace the most iconic coach, not only in college basketball, but in sport. And uh, really, I mean, it, it, we didn't just start, um, you know, trying to kind of figure out what we we were going to do with with coaches retirement and replacement um, when I was appointed obviously had been involved in the process a, a few weeks prior um, to my appointment but it really was all part of the whirlwind and so I kind of feel like I earned my stripes a week in <laughs> no doubt yeah Dr. White's like here's a baton you yeah. took off running um, what, what do you hope to achieve in your first 100 days as the athletic director um, obviously first was uh, naming a replacement for Coach K, but outside of that. Sure. You know, I was asked this question recently. And so, um, again, to kind of give some context and timeline, in May, I, I was appointed, uh, but not effective until September 1st. However, um, Dr. White did um, go ahead and pass the baton in mid-June. So kind of when I started is a little bit fluid. So when that 100 days starts is a little fluid. Um, and and what, what do we want to accomplish in 100 days? I would say more, I'm looking at it kind of this year, um, especially because as I came in, um, you know, the transition is a little bit easier because I know the people and the place. So a lot of times ADs coming in in their first hundred days, it's the listening tour and getting to know everybody and um, really wanting to meet the people um, that, that make this place up. I already had the, the luxury of knowing folks. Um, and so I'm looking at it more in terms of this year. What is it that we want to accomplish in this year? Um, but I do have to say, um, I did go on a bit of a listening tour and I plan to continue that over this year. Um, I really needed to sit down with each of our head coaches. We've got 27 sports and, and really understand from them um, vision, wants, needs, um, desires for their respective programs. Because while I had have been here for, for 13 years prior to this, um, I hadn't really listened in that way to our head coaches, hadn't had those conversations with our head coaches. So I had a re-relationship with everyone. I'm just in a different role now and listening in a different way. And so that was really important to me to accomplish this summer, which is something that I did do. Um, and then sitting down with members of our executive staff and our senior staff and same thing, listening in a different way. Um, I'm still your colleague, but now I'm, I'm your leader. And, and so really wanting to understand program vision from each of our department heads. Um, we have almost 400 full-time employees within, within athletics and that encompasses, encompasses varsity athletics, rec and PE and the golf course. Um, and so I've got a lot of people to really get to know. And so so over this year, again, that's that's a huge um, uh, priority for me to, to be able to sit down with our whole department one on one and get to know folks. And then our student athletes, we have 750 student athletes and relationships are so important and they need to understand that we as administrators are here for them. We're here for their experience. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have jobs, um, but we really are here to make their experience the very best experience that it can be. And so it starts with relationship. Now, I don't 
don't think I have time to sit down one-on-one -on -one with 750 student athletes, but this year, my priority is to at least sit down with each of the freshmen individually, get to know the freshmen. So then moving on next year, I can get to know that freshman class and then kind of keep going. So I'm going to take it in, in small chunks here and, and get to know. So that's over this year as well. And then in terms of organizational structure, um, not, I'm not making any crazy decisions, changing anything. We're not broken, uh, but I really do want to take this year to kind of figure out our staff and is everyone um, working um, in the areas that are to their strengths? Where do we have weaknesses and can kind of make sure that we're covered? We have a huge retirement coming up at the end of this year. Our top development officer, our deputy athletic director for philanthropy is retiring. So that's big. Um, so I really kind of want to, again, take the year to figure out what's the best organizational structure structure for our organ for our for our unit and um and then perhaps make some changes next year so we've got a lot to do this upcoming year but i'm really really excited for what lays ahead yeah goodness that's uh that's quite the slate um you've mentioned a couple times dr kevin white and you know in the, of the course of your uh, trajectory to becoming the athletic director obviously he's he's played a, a massive role uh what has been his role in the transition period and how has he uh you know been able to assist you with that how often do you speak with them what's your relationship like now well i am so fortunate to be uh branch number 30 on his tree so uh 30 folks that i have worked um with him in an athletic department have gone on to become athletic directors or commissioners so um he is named the godfather of college athletics for good reason um quite a quite a mentor and and he's mentored hundreds of of uh people in in this business it's um absolutely amazing the the life lessons and and professional lessons he has to teach us all so um what a great resource he has been for me throughout my career. And the absolutely amazing thing is he's not gone far. So he, um, in retirement, has become a full-time professor at Fuqua, our business school, um, and we get to teach class together. So that's something that we have done for the past 13 years, teach together at Fuqua. Um, and now I will continue to teach with him. And so we started the semester in September. And so I get to see him every Monday, <laughs> which is great. And so our class is at four o'clock. I go over to Fuqua a little early and take him my list of issues for the week and bounce ideas off of him, which I mean, I, I mean, have to be able to, to or such so lucky to be able to use that asset, that resource. Um, and he's so willing and he's so gracious. He doesn't want to step on any toes and he's not inserting himself at all, but um, it has has gratefully uh, to me lent his expertise and, and um, so glad I can still rely on him. And we're having fun teaching together. It's fun to see him in this new role, Professor White. Professor White, indeed. It, Nina, you talked about looking at it, not necessarily in the first 100 days, but the first year. Part of that first year, part of the first 100 days, maybe even sooner than that, was a, a landmark issue in college athletics name, image, and likeness. And uh, for short, people call it NIL, but the opportunity and the ability for student athletes to use their name, image, and likeness for uh, promotional purposes and, and have a little bit more freedom with all of that. Where do you feel Duke stacks up in, in the ranks with, with team or departments and universities that have uh, taken on that challenge? Were the Blue Devils prepared for that? And where do you see it going over the course of the next year. Sure. I mean, I, we're in a great position here at Duke. And, and first, let me say, I am definitely in favor of name, image, and likeness and, and where we can provide opportunities for our student athletes um, to be like other students um, is a plus in my book. You know, students on campus can go out and promote themselves and their businesses and, and endeavors for commercial purposes. Student athletes weren't allowed to do that before. And why not? I mean, so I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that we are kind of moving into modern times and we're moving this, some of these archaic rules, NCAA rules, um, into, into 2021, which is great. And so it's giving student athletes the flexibility to 
you know, um, do social media ads or um, to host a camper clinic in their name, or we've had student athletes write books before and they weren't able to promote them and go on book tours. So now things like that. It's wonderful that they have these opportunities um, to make a few bucks here and there. Um, it's not pay for play. There's no recruiting inducements. Um, and so again, it, it's just a flexible opportunity. I will say at Duke, you know, it, it's great. Um, you know, we've got a great brand um, and, and sponsor Sponsors um, are interested in our student athletes and, and providing them opportunities. I think a lot of because of the strength of the Duke brand, which is wonderful. Um, we really spent this summer trying to educate our student athletes, our staff, um, other constituents, university administrators, our fans about NIL, what it is, um, and, and really learning about our student athletes' wants and needs, um, teaching them the opportunities that are available to them, and, and then really just trying to figure out how we can best support them. Um, it's, it's still, we're in uncharted waters. Um, the rules are not really kind of set in stone. We can be flexible around them, which is weird to say about an NCAA rule, but it's really an institutional rule. Um, so we're really going to keep watch. The next three months are going to be really important um, to kind of watch how this shakes out and see where we need to maybe target more educational efforts um, and, and or pivot in our support for student athletes in different ways. So it's, it's interesting. It's, we're all kind of out, out there, um, all together institutions trying to figure this out, which it's definitely been an interesting time. Do you think that the fact that some of these rules are a little uh, ambiguous or, or difficult perhaps to, to get a finger on um, makes it more difficult or does that present an opportunity for Duke? And you mentioned some of the brands that are interested in, in the university to maybe be creative and, and find unique ways in, in making this work. Yeah, you know, I mean, first, let me say it's been difficult because the lack of guidance from the NCAA was really challenging. Um, we, we, the NCAA was preparing for NIL um, up until mid-June, um, and then um, they declined to, to come out with an NCAA-specific rule and left it to all of the institutions to decide um, what our institutional rule was going to be. And then add on to that, we've got several states that have their own state legislation that institutions need to follow. So we're kind of the wild west right now with state laws, institutional legislation, and no NCAA guidance. So again, those are the uncharted waters that none of us um, were prepared for um, and have, have never been in. Um, but again, we, we the flexibility allowed us to create our own policies and systems that really fit Duke and fit our students. So I'm pleased with how our institutional policy came out. Um, it's pretty flexible in, in providing the opportunities for students. Um, and again, like I said, we since it is institutional policy, we can tweak it and, and figure out what's what continues to be best for our student athletes. I know as an offensive lineman or former offensive lineman, my first thing would have been to sign, find an NIL deal with a local barbecue place or yeah. something. <laughs> get some free meals. Um, so I'm pretty bummed I missed out on that. There, there are, though, and, and not to um, diminish the, the impact of a local barbecue joint, but some, some massive players that, uh, and you mentioned, have an interest in Duke and you know, several uh, third party organizations come to my mind, you know, Teamworks, Influencer, Altia Sports, Partners. What is a way that you can go about perhaps leveraging some of, some of those networks to better enhance opportunities for student athletes that do. Yeah, I and mean, that's exactly it, Dave. Those partnerships really have enhanced our efforts. We, um, new to us, new to these companies. And so let's really leverage our relationships, um, leverage knowledge um, and, and really get together so that we can, again, provide the very best resource for our student athletes um, as we go about this. Um, you mentioned Altius. That's a, a group um, that we've been engaged with in terms of providing education uh, for our student athletes and our staff. And they, in fact, have been on campus um, these last two days doing educational sessions um, with student athletes on how to get started with NIL, um, some of the financial challenges like taxes and other things for students to consider. Um, so that, that's one group that we've partnered with for education. And then we're using Teamworks and Influencer 
um, to provide help for student athletes looking to build their brands, teach the student athletes about branding and the importance of branding and how they can make themselves more attractive to potential sponsors. So they're really experts in, in the branding space. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I'm excited that we've got, we've partnered with several different companies so we can kind of, you know, find the best of the best to, um, again, provide the resources for our student athletes. So, so far it's, it's worked out great. Um, and, and these companies, are working with other schools too. And so we can use, you know, kind of best practices, what they've gleaned from working with other institutions as well, what's working and what's not. You got a, a, a few more NIL questions I'd like sure. to hit on um, it, to get a little, little bit more specific and how it's impacted the department um, on a more acute level. Do you feel like the, the NIL policies or, or this opportunity perhaps benefits one sport over another? No, not really. You know, we're seeing um, a lot of opportunities across our 27 sports. Now, of course, our high profile student athletes, there have been some deals that have been announced. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt that that some of those um, student athletes are, are um, you know, gaining opportunities because of the high profile nature, um, men's basketball. Um, we've seen some, some large deals in lacrosse. Um, but again, we've seen opportunities across our 27 sports, which is just great. One of my favorites is um, some of our women's basketball players have an Instagram account, Duke Foodies. Um, it, they really are into the, the local food scene. And so they've done several ads for local juice bars and, and little boutique restaurants around town. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's NIL. I mean, providing those neat different opportunities for our student athletes. So we're seeing significant activity. Um, and, and again, uh, we need to make sure that we continue to stay on top of educating our student athletes so they they don't get themselves into into trouble and kind of go outside the guardrails that we've put around um, the, the our particular rules. Um, but so far, so good. It's great. You, you mentioned some of the particular rules, obviously in place to protect some of the student athletes and and some of the partnerships there. Are there any adverse uh, impacts to NIL, maybe on the fundraising front, uh, an impact where? Perhaps maybe someone was willing to, to donate initially to a, a team as a whole, and now they're singling out a specific student athlete. Sure. Well, that was a big concern going into it, not knowing if our, our sponsors or our donors would, would pivot from, like you mentioned, to those particular donations to Duke, um, Duke Athletics and, and want to give directly to student athletes. But to this point, we haven't seen any of that activity. Um, you know, our, our donors and sponsors love being associated with, with the Duke brand. Um, and so they want to help all of our student athletes as a part of the Duke brand. So they're still interested in helping to provide scholarship support support, academic support, um, things like leadership training and career prep. Um, so some are interested in, in working directly with student athletes and, and that's great. We do think that there's room for both. Um, and so we've kind of tried to help co connect some of the dots, um, but so far we haven't, haven't lost sponsors or donors. Nina, earlier you mentioned you know, when we introduced NIL that this isn't pay for play. And part of that, uh, that kind of got bundled up, it seemed, leading up to this NIL release uh, of the pay-for-play conversation. Do you feel like that has gone away? Do you anticipate maybe the pay-for-play or, or paying student athletes you know, coming back? And is that still a conversation that you're monitoring and anticipating to, to have to act on before too long? Sure, we're always monitoring the pay-for-play conversation. I don't think that's something that will ever go away. Um, but you know, it's it's definitely a transformational time in, in college athletics, not only NIL. I mean, I think NIL has has come, we've addressed it and we're moving forward, um, living with NIL now. But now we have other things like the NCAA constitutional convention is coming up and, and that's where we're really kind of as an organization, as a membership organization, all of the institutions in the NCAA make up the NCAA. We're, we're almost kind of having like an identity crisis. And so we're, we're just trying to figure out what is the mission of the NCAA and, and what is the role and responsibility of the NCAA in college athletics. So this constitutional convention is really doing a deep dive on, on what should the main, ups, main principles um, of the NCAA be. 
And so we're looking to, to see some work uh, out of the NCA Constitutional Convention come um, likely at the beginning of next year uh, with some potential big rules changes and, and shift uh, in the NCA structure by next, next uh, academic year. Um, and and we, we at Duke look forward to really participating in that discussion. Um, you know, college athletics everywhere, uh, but especially at Duke has, has been more than just what happens on the field um, or on the court or in the pool. Um, we really want to make sure um, that athletics at Duke fits into the broader university mission, um, the, the academic mission with a focus on academic success and preparing student athletes to be successful in life after Duke, to be global citizens, to be leaders in their fields and, and in the world. Um, so I'm excited about change and, and all of the, the kind of issues, as we say, uh, in the collegiate athletics landscape and really kind of not knowing what we're going to look like, um, you know, next year, five years, 10 years down the road. I'm excited for my role um, as a leader of Duke Athletics to really position Duke to be at the forefront of change and to to, to be a modern, innovative athletics department um, in our you know, modern, innovative university setting. So um, that's a lot to say is, is pay for play still a question, but you know, I think it's always going to be talked about and, and really kind of in the context of amateurism. And I think we need to, to consider what is amateurism, um, you know, how we define it in 2021 um, relative to the NCAA and college athletics as we know it today. You know, you talked about the opportunity to be leaders in in the world, really, and in, in creating student athletes that go on uh, to have great impact. So part of the way um, that Duke Athletics can do that, obviously, is is in um, social change and making sure that uh, the Blue Devils are are up to par, if not leading the way on on certain social initiatives. And uh, one thing that's gotten a lot of attention lately is diversity equity and inclusion, and then at Duke and belonging, and uh, you know, DEI and B for short, but um, there, there's been a, a pretty significant strategic planning process for DEI and B uh, at Duke and, and within Duke Athletics. Can you run us through kind of what that process has been? Who's, who's a part of that strategic planning process? And ultimately, what's the mission of Duke, Duke Athletics when it comes to diversity? Sure. Um, really exciting. We, as you mentioned, are going through a strategic planning process specifically for DEI and B. DEI B. Um, and, uh, you know, we really last year um, was an awakening in, in so many ways um, for so many reasons. And I was really proud of our student athletes and, and our staff um, and, and people of color in our department, student athletes and staff that really. Um, found their voice, amplified their voice, amplified their message. Um, and, and as administrators, we were um, so happy to support their, those student athletes in, in their endeavors. Um, but it, it, it can't be just a moment um, where we say, okay, we're, we are going to um, project this message of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. It's something that we need to live out every day um, and, and show our commitment to it and, and really live those the, the values and principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and so we engaged um, a consultant and we're going through the strategic planning process. And so we assembled a committee, a cross section of folks um, from uh, senior leadership within athletics, head coaches, assistant coaches, administrators um, from a variety of different areas um, to really kind of be our steering committee um, working on the strategic plan. But then we've, we conducted um, surveys and focus groups and we're really involving folks across the whole department, as well as our student athletes. We surveyed all of our student athletes to really get a sense of climate um, and, and, and what, what they believe um, we're doing well and not so well relative to, to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So we're in the midst of that process right now. I think we're, we're hoping to get our strategic plan by the end of this calendar year. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it's really important, and, and this question was asked by staff, is it something that you look at, you read, and you put on a shelf 
yourself somewhere? And the answer is emphatically no. We are doing this. We will make it public um, so that we can tell the world, here's what we're doing. And then we're going to have to hold ourselves accountable to taking steps um, to enact parts of the strategic plan. And, and we are going to do that. I mean, that's why we're engaged in this process. Um, it's really important to me. And I know it's important to our staff and especially to our student athletes that we are leaders in this space. So looking forward to, to the outcome um, of, of the strategic plan and it'll really kind of give us a blueprint for moving forward um, relative to our initiatives around DEI and B. Nina, you, you talked about taking over uh, and, and sitting in the athletic director chair. Um, certainly special given your uh, lead up and the experience that you have, but you and I have had conversations about the fact that you're a female and a black female makes it even more impactful. Um, and considering you look at the landscape of college athletics, there, there aren't many uh, athletic directors that are like you uh, in that sense. And when you when you consider DEI and B and your background there and, and who you are, do you feel an added sense of pressure um, when it comes to considering those topics and, and how it um, maybe gets uh, adopted within Duke Athletics? Sure. Um, not pressure. I'm excited. Um, I am excited to be a part of progress. Um, there are three people that look like me in the Power Five. Um, and I was actually just talking with my good friend Candace, uh, Candace Lee at Vanderbilt and Carla Williams at Virginia. I'll get to see this weekend when we take Duke football up to Charlottesville. Um, but there's three of us, Black females in the Power Five, 65 institutions. Um, and so we're progress, but that's it. And so um, I wouldn't say I feel pressure, but I feel great responsibility. Um, now I sit at the table and I am one of the, those leaders. I mean, I, I sat at the table before, but in a different way, right? As, as a leader and decision maker for Duke Athletics, I have an opportunity to ensure that we are creating opportunities for women and people of color um, in this business. And so um, it's, like I said, progress, it's baby steps, um, but I'm ready to keep doing the work and, and I understand my position um, and, and the responsibility that I have. And, and so not just for, for right now, people in our department, but um, to build our pipeline. I mean, we need to get uh, women and people of color, people from underrepresented groups in at the entry level so that we can invest in them in their careers early and continue to promote them um, and, and build our bench. Um, but then I, as I said in, in uh, my press conference back in May, um, you know, I, I want little girls who look like me to know that they can dream big and, and achieve big dreams, but I'm also a boy mom. And so I want little boys to know that too. And just, just really want, want kids to understand, um, to have big dreams because you can achieve them. I mean, it takes hard work and, and a lot of determination and, and, and grit, um, but you can do it. So, I mean, there's a, a lot to um, who I am and, and what I look like, but I understand the responsibility and, and I'm excited um, about that. So here we go. Here we go, indeed. Uh, one last thing on DEI and B. Uh, the, the, the B part uh, of the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, sticks out to me in the belonging. What, what exactly does that mean to you and how do you see that fitting into the larger picture of DEI and B? Sure. Well, I mean, belonging is, it's really important. It's, it's the effort to build a strong sense of community um, amongst our, our student athletes, our coaches and our staff. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a commitment to reinforce the fact that we, Duke Athletics, really care about you, student athletes, coaches and staff, um, that you are a valued member of the team. Um, I think, you know, the challenge in belonging is there's natural silos that can be built up with 750 student athletes, you know, in their individual teams, um, 300 plus staff, almost 400 staff in their individual departments, silos naturally can build up. So how do we break down those silos, make sure that we're cross pollinating and creating a sense of community, um, really
really important. You know, we we consider when when we're figuring out the community piece, um, what traditions foster community, and and how can we highlight that everyone really is a part of the team? Um, what small things can we do to break down those those silos? How do we build connectivity and and community? Um, and and so what does that look like? Is it programming, events, social, um, educational? Um, we've got a lot of opportunity, uh, but to bring it back to belonging, belonging really is that connectivity, that community piece. And so something that that needs that we wanted to be in our title, DEIB um, strategic plan, because it is an important um, critical principle of what we're doing here. You mentioned community. Um, there's been a lot of change in the uh, greater community, especially when you consider the, the athletic community of power five conferences. And um, wasn't that long ago that the Alliance came out after the SEC went out and acquired Oklahoma and Texas and um, a, a bunch of other Power Five conferences are looking at each other saying, okay, what are we going to do to strengthen our community? Um, how do you see that uh, necessarily impacting Duke and where do you see that taking place as it continues to develop over, over the next, in the coming years, how does Duke's involvement in that fit in? Sure. Excited about the alliance. And um, yes, it was uh, right after the, the SEC gained two members and um, got bigger there. Um, but it really was it was about something different um, than, than conference realignment or conference expansion. Um, it's really unique. It's, it's different. We've got an amazing new ACC commissioner who really spearheaded this effort. And um, the alliance is historic. It is across three conferences. The the ACC, Big Ten, and Pac-12, 41 um, world-class institutions um, put together in, in a group to really collaborate on, on the future evolution of, of college athletics. I mean, like we talked about, there's a lot going on and, and this collegiate landscape is changing. And so um, the 41 of us are, are kind of banding together. Um, like-minded institutions, um, you know, academically and athletically, and, and really guided by a, a commitment of, of supporting student-athlete well-being, um, academic and athletic opportunities, and their um, student-athlete experiences, and, and diversity. Um, it's, we, we all have shared values. A number of the schools are, are AAU institutions. Um, we're all broad-based athletic programs. I mean, at Duke, we have 27 sports, and I think you'll see that across most ACC Big 10 and Pac-12 schools. Um, we sponsor numerous championships um, in, in those three conferences. There is a scheduling piece. Yes, we are going to look to play each other um, where we can. Um, you know, I think it's it's easy to your mind jump to, to football and maybe men's and women's basketball, but we'll look around creative and unique opportunities and scheduling um, for a lot of our Olympic sports. You know, it doesn't mean that we're going to fly back and forth to Stanford every weekend for every sport, but, but where can we really get get creative. Um, you know, we, I have so much confidence in, in our leadership in the ACC leadership as, as well as the big 10 and the PAC 12 commissioners to really guide us through figuring out what this alliance is and, and how we're going to, to execute. But I think it's exciting um, and, and really gives us an, an, a fun opportunity going forward. Um, let me just throw in, I, this isn't part of the alliance, but an example of, of where we could potentially go. So I don't know um, how many folks know about the ACE program that we have here at Duke, the, the um, Rubenstein Bing uh, Athletes for Civic Engagement. And um, seven years ago, we partnered with Stanford, Duke partnered with Stanford to send student athletes on civic engagement projects. Um, in the summer. So our student athletes don't have an opportunity to study abroad or at Duke, they don't have an opportunity to participate in Duke Engage, which is typically an eight week civic engagement program um, because the nature of college athletics, it's year round almost anymore. So um, we created a program where we send um, student athletes uh, out into the world to do three week civic engagement projects. And so we've got four sites around the world where we send 10 student athletes, five Duke and five Stanford um, for three weeks to, to do service. Um, and it's really been an amazing, amazing program. And it's they don't just go do the service and then come back and it's done. I mean, they come back and they create action plans about how they're going to use their experience going forward. We've seen student athletes change majors around what they've done on their service projects. We've seen 
student athletes become really good friends with Stanford student athletes. I mean, it's absolutely amazing what, what this program has done. So things like that, we can really highlight in the Alliance. And so maybe we throw a big 10 team in there too. I don't know. We, we really like our, our um, partnership with Stanford, but um, so the Alliance, I'm just trying to highlight that it's not just about, you know, Duke playing Stanford in football every other year. Um, we really have some opportunities to, to create unique experiences across three, three conferences with our student athletes. Yeah, and it gives the Atlantic Coast Conference and all the member institutions a chance to flex their muscles a little bit, both in the in the classroom, outside of the classroom, and on the athletic field. So very, exactly. very cool opportunity. Um, you mentioned having a focus on some of the, the broader issues um, at hand and, and the opportunity for leadership from Duke Athletics. I know you've put an emphasis on mental health for the student athletes. Um, I got an email as, a, as an uh, employee of Duke Athletics not that long ago talking about different opportunities that are available to me um, because of some of the work and the emphasis you've put on the mental health aspect, as well as the nutrition aspect and, and fueling the bodies appropriately of the student athletes that, that are uh, associated with Duke Athletics. What do you see as, as the, maybe the next step as you continue to, to push some of those initiatives uh, and, and assisting the student athletes to have as many resources as they possibly can? Yeah. Are you talking about the Calm app that we provide? I am. <laughs> yeah. So really neat. Um, the ACC actually gave us um, access to the Calm app um, for all of our student athletes. Um, and now we've got an opportunity to provide it uh, free of charge to all of our, our um, staff as well, which is interesting. I was just talking with some folks today. You know, yes, our, our one of our um, critical priorities is um, the mental health, um, the well-being of our student athletes. I mean, this is a holistic experience for our student athletes, not just um, come and, and play your sport and then leave. Um, it really is, um, it, you know, their, their mental well-being is, is a huge part of um, the holistic experience, but also for our staff. I mean, mental health is, is really a critical, um, critical priority for our staff. I mean, we, we need to make sure that we are um, taking care of ourselves and, and that we are prepared um, to come to work each day to lead these student athletes. Um, and so Calm app for the staff as well, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, I, in terms of mental health. I mean, it was highlighted uh, pretty dramatically there during the during the COVID pandemic, um, the early days, and, and as we kind of continue to navigate this pandemic, because my goodness, it is not over. Um, but we've got behavioral health staff that were really forced into a position to kind of manage the trauma of the moment uh, with, with COVID and the pandemic. There was so much going on, um, student athlete anxiety, um, forced isolation where we were all of a sudden everyone living uh, one in a room. When we traveled, our student athletes um, were only allowed to be one per, per hotel room. Um, I mean, it, it, it was a lot last year. Um, and so our behavioral health staff was just so wonderful in, in helping us manage and, and helping coaches um, managed that moment. Um, and we survived. We got through the year last year. Um, and so now we're moving from kind of firefighting to fire prevention. This year, the pandemic is still here, but we've learned how to live with it. Um, and and our, our behavioral health staff is, is on the ground still with our student athletes and our coaches working conscientiously to, to deliver education, um, first responder kind of techniques for our student athletes, our coaches and our staff um, versus you know, kind of patient visits being the, the loan option prior to this year. So we've also have, have several affinity groups. Um, we've got Morgan's Message, um, a, a student athlete group um, that really focuses on mental health and well-being for student athletes. And so we are excited to support them and their mission um, relative to education um, on, on mental health. Um, we conduct lots of programming for our student athletes and our coaches workshops. Um, we've got uh, a dedicated team to eating disorders and um, uh, a group that's that's assisting our student athletes build peer groups um, to, to prevent um, and educate around eating disorders. And then obviously we've got folks on campus. I mean, we're building strategic partnerships with campus units. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We've got caps on campus. Um, and so 
so we're partnering with them to continue to provide these services for our student athletes who obviously are, are part of the student community. Um, and so we're just really excited to be able to augment what, what the services that CAPS provides um, to specifically our student athletes. Finally, from me, Nina, uh, I, you mentioned the, the COVID pandemic and the stress that it put on staff, but it, it's in particular the student athletes. You look back at last spring and the Blue Devils came away with seven ACC titles. I mean, that, that's a, a phenomenal rate of success when you consider all that they had to go through. How do you build on that momentum coming off of uh, last spring and now moving to a, a, an area of, of life, hopefully that's a little less impacted by the, the pandemic? How does Duke grow from, from that success and use the momentum moving forward? Absolutely. We're so excited to build on the competitive success. Um, I mean, in a year that was so strange in so many ways to bring home seven ACC championships is just so incredibly exciting. And so um, obviously the momentum competitively, we we are looking to build upon. Um, but like I said, I mean, last year we we were just trying to survive COVID and, and figure it out. And, and how could we pull off an athletic season um, across all of our sports, indoors, outdoors, big teams, little teams, how can we do this? Um, and the NCAA shifted season. So, so fall sports were playing in the spring and, and not normal at all. But Dave, we did it, dang it. And, and we came out of it and, um, and we're better for it. And so this year, pandemic is still here, but we're learning how to navigate and how to, how to still um, have the very best student athlete experience possible, given what we're living with now. Um, I think an, an added bonus, it's great to be able to have fans back. Um, we've got, got fans in Wallace Wade and Cameron's opening up this Friday with Countdown to Craziness. So we'll have fans in there and um, fans at our soccer games. It's, it's just been so exciting. And, and that's part of, part of the game day experience, the, the fan piece. Um, so, you know, I mean, COVID's here, we're figuring it out. Um, and I'm just really proud. I have to, to give a shout out to our student athletes, just really proud of, of them for persevering um, through what we went through last year and really staying committed and dedicated to following all the rules. We really had very minimal interruptions last year um, and, and we're doing it this year. And so I'm, I'm excited for the seasons to be here and to be somewhat normal um, and, and looking forward to watching all of our teams compete. Without a doubt, well, Nina, it's been it's been my honor to be with you this evening. But you mentioned some of the student athletes. Um, this DSBC group has done such a fantastic job of, of creating a community. Um, some with student athletes, some general student population. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Now I'd like to turn it over to some of those uh, folks that are part of this special group. Um, Nakai Montgomery, uh, a two sport athlete uh, for the Duke Blue Devils, Alexis Williamson and Sean Vaziri to ask you a few questions. Um, so the hard hitters have yet to come. And with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Sean uh, to take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Hey, Nina, it's great to see you again. Um, I was curious if you had any thoughts on the sports betting bill that passed through the North Carolina Senate in August and how you know the legalization of sports betting potentially in North Carolina will impact both, you know, Duke athletics and our uh, student athletes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, again, one of those, those kind of issues that we're keeping an eye on, but um, it's interesting that the, the bill, um, it wouldn't be too dramatic of a change in some ways, um, since we're kind of already dealing with it. Our teams travel to states that allow sports wagering. I mean, within the ACC, Virginia and Pennsylvania um, already uh, allow sports wagering. Um, and many of our games are bet on around the country. Um, and so what we continue to focus on and, and really it's a huge priority. Gosh, everything is a priority for us, but but a huge focus is providing education, um, especially in the sports that are frequently involved. Um, warnings about providing information about team injuries or, or matchups or any types of information that might be valuable to betters. We're really trying to educate our student athletes um, and staff, frankly, not to talk about those things. Um, the ACC has a partner that monitors betting lines to look for unusual 
unusual activity. It's fascinating. Um, uh, some staff at the ACC office kind of took us through last spring sports and, and showed us some of the games that, that got significant activity around our Olympic sports, which I found very interesting. Um, baseball, women's soccer, lacrosse. Um, so, you know, with their help and that resource, we can adjust educational programming for our student athletes. And, and like I said, we just continue to evaluate um, what, what we need to do um, when, when legislation comes about and, and rules change. So great question. Thanks for asking, Sean. Thanks, Nina. Good evening, Nina. Hi there. As a student, as a student athlete, I had the opportunity to partake in the Nike Summer Internship Program through Duke Athletics. Do you plan on continuing to build out these type of career development opportunities for student athletes and general students? Yes, love that. So I interned at Nike twice, two summers. What building were you in? So I was in Eakin. I was in the, I was, um, I was in Eakin in LA. Um, so I was, yeah, I was in LA. Got it. it. That's an incredible experience. I encourage, um, I was not a student athlete and still was able to obtain a Nike uh, summer internship. So encourage anyone that, that might be interested. Um, I spent two incredible summers out in Beaverton on their campus. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, you asked a great question. Um, it is career development is a really important part of what we do. And, and when you come in, we want to help you understand the importance of a resume and building your resume and, and how do you network and how do you seek out careers um, and, and jobs? And, um, you know, when you come in as a student athlete, we don't want you to kind of come in, practice, compete, and then, okay, we're done with you and spit you out and good luck on graduation. It is important to us to prepare you for life after Duke because there's life after Duke, um, whether that's four years, five years, now we're seeing some six years with extra eligibility with from, from COVID. Um, it, it is really important to us um, to open open up the Duke network for you. We have so many amazing Duke alums um, around the country in, in so many businesses and industries. Um, and so opening up that network, making the connections, helping you connect the dots and, and really explore, explore what career journey um, is of most interest to you. We're here to help do that. So um, career development, we've got a staff member directly focused. And again, it's one of those services that we're not reinventing the wheel. There's career services on campus as well. And so we enjoy a great relationship with them um, and, and partner with them to to provide um, a robust experience for our student athletes. Great question, thank you. Alexis. Yeah, hi Nina, thank you so much again for being here with us. A lot of great insights so far um, and I really loved hearing from you. So I am an undergraduate student who is also pre-law. Um, and so as someone who's interested in pursuing law school and sports business, I'd love to hear how your journey through law school actually helped prepare you for a career in sports. And is there any advice that you would give to someone like me who's looking to pursue a law degree and then after that law degree go into sports? Yes, I love it. Do it. <laughs> um, you know, the, the law degree, um, it's helpful to what I do, not required, obviously, um, but it's, it's really an, an important um, foundational educational experience uh, that I think has, has really prepared me well um, for my job, for my, my deputy AD job that I was in before this and, and now um, as, as the AD. Um, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of times uh, students will ask, well, should I go to law? school? Should I get my MBA? Should I get a master's in sports management? Um, that is a personal preference and it is completely up to you. I do think that an advanced degree is helpful um, in this field and, and really for a, a big reason to differentiate yourself from everyone that wants to work in sports. Um, and so most will go get a master's in sport management and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a zillion people that have that degree that are trying to get the same job. And so why not be different and, and go get that law experience, that, that, um, that background, um, and, and prepare yourself for, for a career and it, it'll really kind of set you apart. Um, the, the law degree, it's just so helpful in so many ways, the critical thinking, the research, the writing, oh my gosh, the writing, there's so much in law school, but I mean, I write all day, every day in my role, whether I'm, I'm, you know, emails or memos or, or whatever it might be. It's, it's just, it's really important. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage as many people as possible now. I mean, 
mean, I, I knew when I went to law school that I was going to come out and work in college athletics. Um, and, and I wasn't going the, the big law route or really frankly, even any type of law, um, law firm route. Um, and so that was, that was something different. I mean, when I was in law school, all my classmates were talking about what big firms they were going to. Um, but, but I was passionate about the law and the education piece. And so that's why I went to law school and really applied what I learned and that, that skill set to what I'm doing now. So do it, Alexis, um, go for it. And it's really, it's just so helpful. I mean, human resources, um, intellectual property, um, it, there's so many things, um, so many um, aspects of my legal education that I continue to use in my job today. Thanks, Nina. Yes. Ready. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nina. It was such a great conversation and, and really enjoyed a lot of the insight you're able to provide to us tonight. So thank you so much for coming out. Thanks, Brian. I loved it. Great to be with you all. Awesome. Fantastic. So on behalf of the entire student team at DSBC, we would like to first thank Nina and Dave for taking the time to come out and share such insightful information with all of us tonight. We'd also like to thank our alumni and departmental advisory boards for their continued support and specifically Ryan Craig for being a valuable member to help us put this event together tonight. We would also like to thank the departments and organizations at Duke who helped us promote this event, including but not limited to Duke Athletics, Student Affairs, the Office of Undergraduate Education, the Alumni Association, the Career Center, Demon, University Communications, Duke Physical Education and Wellness, and the MMS and INE departments. And additionally, we'd like to thank Saladin Smith and his team at UCAE for handling a lot of the technological aspects of the event backstage for us tonight. And more importantly, everybody in the audience for coming out to hear such an insightful conversation. We hope you're able to learn more about the future of collegiate athletics and potential career paths to go and explore further down the road. Thanks again for joining us. Stay tuned on our website and social media at DSB Conference for updates about more events coming this fall and our annual conference in the spring. Stay safe and have a great night. Thanks again.